Welcome everyone to the Attila playing varsity soccer in university info session. So there's kind of three goals for today's meeting. Um, basically the plan for today is that we have players and coaches from some of the top universities in Canada and the US, and they're gonna be sharing their experience, advice and answering questions on you on how you can sort of play at the next level. And we're kind of basically targeting this presentation for I guess three groups of people. First of all, for the players to learn more about like the process, getting a scholarship, things like that. But also we're gonna address a lot of points that are relevant to parent, uh, parents as well. Because I was going to show earlier on, like, it's a really a team effort. And I think you're more likely to receive success when parents and players are sort of aligned and on the same page. And we're also going to make some points to that can be relevant to coaches and technical directors about how you can sort of set up your program and club for success and getting more of your players to play at the next level. And so the agenda for today is the following. Um, so first of all, we're going to introduce the players and coaches. As you're going to see, we have some very, very impressive list of coaches and players. Then we're going to basically explain the TLA, so the organization that's sort of organizing this event. And then we're going to kind of walk you through the different process of, you know, playing at the varsity university level. And then basically we're going to frame it in a sense of Q&A. So each step is going to be basically be framed as a question. And then finally, we're going to have questions at the end. So for me, I think that the most, the most valuable part of these presentations is the chance we to interact and ask people questions that are very specific and applicable to you. So we're going to make sure we have lots of time to do that. So yeah, logistics, yeah, so I'm gonna be asking questions. Feel free to um, put comments, questions in, in the chat at any time. And also, by the way, fun fact, so we're gonna send, so the meeting will be recorded. Also, the slides are gonna be shared with you afterwards. And then the other thing I was gonna mention was that, yeah, so we'll also have Q&A at the end. So if you have questions during Q&A, you, um, you can raise your hand. But in the meantime, put lots of co um, comments in the chat and we'll be monitoring that very closely. And also, by the way, all these players you're seeing, these are all mentors on TLS. So if you click on their profile, um, you can basically, you know, learn more about them. Yeah. Okay. So first, let's do the introductions. So let me let me let me stop sharing so everyone can see the people well. And yeah, so we can just go in the order of the pictures. And so we're going to start with Sosa. Hi, my name is Sosa. I go to the University of Connecticut position. I play right back and left back. Uh, my previous team, so Academy, I played in the MLS USDA League for Vardar Academy. And for Summer Bowl, I played for DCFC, U, uh, was the U23s in the USL, and my hometown, London, Ontario, and currently in the process of preparing for some pro trials. And your favorite player? Uh, Hakimi. So, and then, yeah, so just for context, the, the, um, each person just say your name, position, hometown where you grew up, yeah, position you play on the field, club you currently play for or used to play for and your favorite player. And so next we can go with Ashley. Hi everyone, uh, players, coaches and parents. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Ashley. I grew up in Bradford, Ontario and then um, went on to play for Newmarket Soccer Club. Um, I was recruited by the University of Dayton where I went on a full ride scholarship and played four years, um, graduating there as the top leading scorer for women's soccer. During that time, I was also uh, had the opportunity to play for the U20 Women's National Team. So I played in the U20 World Cup in 2014. Um, after graduating from Dayton, I went on to play one season in the Czech Republic professionally and then finished my career with London FC in League One. So I am now retired and uh, I don't play for a club. Favorite player, Sam Kerr on the women's side and Kylian Mbappe on the men's side. Thank you, Ashley. Corday. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Corday Olabegi. Hometown is Windsor, Ontario. Uh, that's where I grew up. I played for Windsor FC Nationals over there up until grade 10. Then after grade 10, I went to Georgia and joined a prep school. And then um, I ended up walking on to a school called the College of William and Mary in Virginia. And at that time, it was, they were, we finished that season top 20. So I, I didn't play that much. So but it was still a good experience being on a team like that. And then I finished up, I finished up my career at Columbia University in New York. Um, I also played summers in NPSL for a team called Virginia Legacy. And I play defense outside back or outside mid. And then my favorite player right now is not currently playing, but JJ Okacha, which is a Nigerian player from back in the day. And then on the women's side, Sydney LaRue. And I'm currently retired. I graduated in 2018 from college, so. Next person. Cecilia, sorry, I was trying to pin people. Cecilia. 
Hi everyone, my name is Cecilia. Um, my hometown is Victoria, BC, where I played for Vancouver Island Wave in the HPL League. I'm currently in Kingston, Ontario, just finished up my last year playing for Queen's University, um, where I played center forward. Um, and my favorite player is Sam Kerr. Next, Christy. Hey guys, similar to CC. Um, my name is Christy. I grew up in BC, but Vancouver. I played for Fusion FC and HPL or BCSPL. I'm not sure the up to date name for the league. Um, and after that, I went and played at Queens uh, in U Sports. I played primarily as a winger, and I graduated in December of last year. And I signed my first professional contract and moved to Sweden in March of this year. And just got home a few weeks ago. Um, and hope to go back to Europe over in January. Um, for a position in Sweden, I played more of like a center forward like CC, but probably belong more on the wing. Um, and my favorite player, I promise I'm not jumping on the bandwagon, it is Sam Kerr. <laughs> and I'd say for men, uh, Alfonso Davies or Mbappe, but yeah, can't beat Sam Kerr's backflip celebration. So she's my fave. Next, we have Quinn. Hey everyone, my name is Quinn Stommer. Um, I'm a goalkeeper. I currently play at Western University, but I started my career at Drake University, which is an NCAA Division I school. I transferred to Manhattan College, and then amid COVID, I came back home and I play for Western now. I'm from Toronto, Ontario. I play for North Toronto Nitros in the summer, and I play League One Premier with them. And my favorite player is Manuel Neuer on the men's side and Steph Labbe on the women's side. Nice. Next, we have Drayden. Drayden, I think you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Hi, everyone. I'm Drayden Kelly. So I'm from Windsor, Ontario. And I started out at York University. Uh, then from there, I transferred over to Wofford in South Carolina. Uh, I was looking for a full scholarship. Uh, did my due dil diligence, messaged a bunch of coaches, I uh, got that work in and then uh, got my scholarship to Wofford. After that, went to U of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Um, and then after that, so at Texas, I was starting my master's there and playing uh, for my final season. After that, I, I stopped my master's to uh, go on my pro trout. So right now I'm just uh, in the midst of uh, leaving uh, for a pro opportunity soon. Um, and my team that I used to play with in the summer was FC Golden State. I also played with Tecumseh over here, uh, one of Ryan's teams right there. Um, and yeah, my favorite player, Cristiano Ronaldo. Favorite center back, though, Sergio Ramos. I'm a center back. Next, we have Rena. Hi everyone, my name is Raina. I'm from, my hometown is Whistler, BC. Um, I originally started playing at Whistler Youth Soccer Club, then moved to North Shore Girls Soccer Club and finished up my high school at uh, Fusion FC as well. Um, and then currently I just finished up my last year playing for the University of Toronto as a fullback slash wing back. Um, favorite player is Julie Ertz. <laughs> Next, we have time to start now the coaches, Mario. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Halliper. Um, I was actually born in uh, Croatia, uh, and I moved to Canada when I was nine years old, and I've been here ever since. Never been back, to be fair. Um, I, uh, I've been fortunate enough to make a living out of the game for the last 30 years, and uh, part of the responsibility that I'll be, I guess, sharing some experiences with about, about is tonight is uh, my, my coaching at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. I've been there for over 20 years, started with both the men's and the women's program, and currently just coach the men's. Mario, do you want to tell them the joke you made about not having a favorite player? Well, <laughs> well I, I didn't think it was a joke. I just said I was too old to have a favorite player. But since I'm being forced to choose, I'm going to choose for the, for, the boy, for the men's, I'm going to choose uh, Tejan Buchanan. And for the women, I'm going to choose Jesse Fleming. Fair. Um, I wasn't forcing you to pick one, by the way, but I just thought it was a funny thing. Um, Carly. Hello, everyone. Carly Tingstad, uh, similar to many others. I'm originally from the West Coast. Um, just moved out here to St. Catharines, Ontario, where I'm currently located um, in August. I am head coach of the Brock Women's Soccer Program. Um, I just have to do a quick shout out to a lot of Thompson Okanagan football players out there. I see a lot of familiar names on the call. Hello, everyone. Nice to see your names. 
Um, and then favorite players, uh, Jesse Fleming. And then I'm just going to add one more, Caroline Weir. Yeah, shout out to the BC people as well, actually. Like, um, I, there was a huge turnout from the BC folks. And I promise next time, I'll try to pick a time that's more PST and EST friendly. So, yeah, shout out to the West Coast. And last but definitely not least, we have Ryan. How's it going? I'm uh, Ryan Madonza. I'm the head coach of the men's team at the University of Windsor. Um, uh, I've had the pleasure of coaching both Cordes and Dradon's older brothers, actually. So that was a unique call, but lots of Windsor presence on the call. Um, uh, favorite player um, that got me started in the game is Jorge Campos, old school goalie. A lot of I see a lot of faces on this call, maybe too young to to know who he is. And actually, on that point, actually, one, one, another thing I'll add that I think is kind of interesting is even while I was telling people about the presentation, a lot of people like would like when they saw the uh, posters of speakers, they'd be like, "Oh, I recognize that person. I recognize that person." And then I was even talking to someone yesterday, and they were like, "Oh, Rena, I think I coach. Her, I think I coach her sister, Rena's sister." So like the Canadian soccer community is like a very small community. So I think um, like, like making like maintaining those relationships with the people you know is super helpful. So I think that's just something to keep in mind as well. And now let's continue with the presentation. Okay, so what's on my screen? Okay, yeah, so we met the players. So yeah, so the plan for today is, so the way we've sort of structured the presentation is that we're kind of going to walk through everything that players need to know in terms of joining a club and like getting to the next level. So from joining a club, recruiting services, are they worth it? Are they not worth it? How do you record good film, showcases camps, scholarships, getting to teams? It's a scholarship for right scholars. So we have another thing that you, as you probably already picked up, is we have a wide range of people, all the way from people that got full right scholarships to people that just got that came on as walk-ons, from people who got recruited in grade nine to people that got recruited in grade 13 in their gap year. So I think you guys will really enjoy like the wide range of experiences we have. Yeah. So first let me explain a bit more about Attila, sort of the organization that is hosting today's um, event. So I actually started Attila back in 2018 when I was in school and I went to school in Canada, but I actually went to probably the, not even probably the most expensive undergrad program in Canada. So my, I went to the Ivy business school and Western engineering program. My tuition was about $30,000 a year. I grew up in a middle-class family. We didn't have $30,000 a year to pay for tuition. So I had to use student loans. And so I'm saying that because a lot of you, whether you go to the U S or you stay in Canada, financing your education is going to be a very big thing. And so, you know, I had these huge amount of student loans and I felt like very frustrated that I had to graduate, that I was graduating school, like starting my life already like $60,000 $60, in debt. And this is a, by the way, this is, if you can't tell, this is a screenshot of my student line of credit. And so for me, obviously this is a huge problem. And so I kind of realized that, you know, when you have this much debt, getting a part-time job will make a small dent, but really the best way to pay off this much debt is with scholarships. So I spent a lot of time applying to scholarships and I built a program to help other people get scholarships. And in the last, since 2018, so basically in the last five years, we've had doubled by 3,000 students get about $50,000 in scholarships. And so you can kind of see some of the events that we've done for students. And we partnered with Thompson Reuters to do a big scholarship recently. And, you know, one of the things I like to do a lot, is, and this is why I like, like events like this, is basically talking to people and learning from people. And one of the, I wonder if the meeting is capped at 100 people because it's been at 100. And I wonder if that's just a coincidence. Anyway, so one of the things I realized doing this event, you know, talking to people was a lot of people are kind of confused about where to go to the next step. Like kind of people are like, okay, like, yes, scholarship, but like, I'm not really sure what I want to do with my life. And for the people that did kind of know what they wanted to do with their life, they were not really sure how to get there. And interestingly, while this was happening, the Canadian World Cup was um, coming around. And something that's kind of interesting about the Canadian World Cup is that two players in the Canadian World Cup, um, Richie Larray and Kyle Larian, I actually played with growing up. Right. So there's this there's this um, account on Instagram, I think it's called Pitch Side Solutions, and they have a team called one of the best soccer teams of all time in Canada. And it's called the Sigma 95s, which is the team that Kyle Larian and Richie Larray played on. And I actually played with them. I played against them in the Sigma training camp. So you can see in this picture here, the background, they were in Sigma and I was part of the training camp. And I actually got invited to join Sigma as well, but I couldn't afford it. And so kind of watching the World Cup, I was super happy to see Canada. But I was kind of watching my own life and thinking to myself that, wow, you know, I was good enough to kind of be invited to join their camp. I was probably good enough, to, you know, who knows if I had, you know, things play out differently, maybe I could have gone to the Canadian World Cup as well, right? And so it just kind of got me thinking down the path of, you know, how far could I have gotten in soccer if I had access to better information, better resources, et cetera. And so we're kind of, and then kind of taking that idea further out and thinking, okay, how can we sort of make sure that, you know, the next generation of like Canadian soccer players and athletes that want to go to the next level, 
how can they sort of tap into the Kenyan community and have like a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship platform to help each other out? And that is the idea behind Attila. And so kind of the way the program works is that we have a wide range of mentors. So basically, as you can see here, we have both Canadian American schools, men, women program, people that transferred into Canada, people that transferred outside of Canada. So you can basically search for the platform to find the ones that best matches you. And then you basically just book a time with the mentor that you want to meet with. And you can basically just pick a time and then have a one-on-one -on -one session with them. And that during that session, and then during that session, you kind of basically put, talk about what, what, what are your soccer goals? What do you want to, what do you want to improve on? Maybe film, ask them to watch some of your game film, give them some feedback on that. Ask them about how they found their recruiting process, what they learned, things they would avoid, things like that. And then you have like a one-on-one -on -one call with them. So you basically meet them for an hour, ask them any questions that you want. And then, so like you can see here, for example, I um, mean, yeah, so, so we both, so Atila has both scholarships and mentorship. So if you're looking for scholarships, you can get that for your school. And if you're looking for mentors, you can find mentors. So let's say, for example, I want to go to Queens. You can just type in Queens and you can see all the different mentors that we have that went to Queens. All right, so that's Atila. Uh, maybe, Aaron, do you want me, maybe, maybe you want to drop a link in the, in the Zoom chat so people can check out Atila if they want to. And then, so let's start now with the, um, with the presentation. So like I said, the way this thing has been sort of framed is that we're going to go through the process and then each step in the journey will be a question. And actually, before I even start, yeah, so this is a timeline. I'm going to get to this. Okay, yeah, here. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so this is basically the steps in the recruitment journey. And then this is like a rough timeline that you should follow. So in your grade nine year, you should basically be talking with your parents about your goals, joining a competitive soccer club. Grade 10 is when the recruiting process really, really starts to ramp up. So, you know, like registering with the NCAA Eligibility Center, contacting coaches, uploading videos, things like that. Grade 11, your junior year, that's when you want to take your SATs. And then your grade 12 year is usually when offers will start going out. And then a thing I added as well was that gap year. So something that is a lot more common than you would think is that some players decide to come back for another year to basically give themselves some more chance to do recruiting. So this is something now that you can also do as well as like, maybe if you didn't get a good school, maybe you need to get your grades up, you can always come back for another year. Now, like I said, this is just a general timeline. Not everyone goes according to this timeline. So usually when people see this timeline and let's say they're in grade 12 and they're like, I'm in grade 12, I'm in grade 11, I haven't started doing any of this stuff yet. I am freaking out. So people say, what happens if I don't follow this timeline? So what we're going to do now, we're going to ask our first question. And it's basically, and then so what we're going to do, I'm going to basically ask these four people to sort of talk about their recruiting journey. And you're going to see the, basically the wide range of people and like how everyone goes, in, goes on a different timeline, but they still end up well. So maybe we'll start with Sosa. So maybe Sosa, can you talk us a bit about your recruiting journey? Hi, hi guys. So my recruiting journey started off in, I want to say ninth grade, playing for Vardar in the MLS Academy. So basically with that, you have coaches watching all your practices and all your games. And the structure of this league basically is it goes from August to December and they provide you um, a showcase wherever they choose fit, generally in Florida. You play three games and you'll have probably like 50 to 100 coaches on the sidelines watching your games, giving you the ability to talk to them afterwards, ask your questions, whatnot, see your video, talk to your coaches themselves and stuff like that. And really from there is how I got my opportunity with the University of Michigan because I transferred from uh, University of Michigan to Connecticut. And basically just that, just going through that process. Um, that's more of an American style rather than Canada. So that was probably the best bet, trying to find the best team, the best program that will really get you to the next level. And so, so, so you got recruited in grade nine. Can you talk a bit more? First of all, how common is it for people to get recruited that early? And what does it look like when like coaches reach out to you at like such a young age? So really it wasn't, it's not very common. So being that at the time, obviously the rules have changed. So a lot of the communication was going from coaches. I mean, the university coaches to my academy coach and then them basically feeding off the information to my parents and I, because you're not able to have those interactions around those times due to some violations and whatnot. So that was probably that, but obviously the rules have changed. Like for example, for my brother, when he was in ninth, 10th grade, um, the schools that he had as well, were reaching out to him and were able to actually have those hand-on communications, whether that being through Zoom, text or whatnot like that, so. Drayden, I think Drayden had to head out for something, so I don't think he's here. Um, so maybe um, Reno will get to you after, but maybe then Quinn. So Quinn, can you talk a bit more about your journey? Because you you're, you had a different path. 
Yeah, so when I was being recruited, I played for Vaughn Soccer Club. Um, a head coach who just could sign, who just, you know, is now affiliated with uh, Halifax Wanderers, was my head coach at the time. That's Patrice Geyser. Um, he's very, very connected in the U.S. And so we went on a ton of different scholarship uh, tournaments and that sort of thing. And from doing that, I was able to get some offers from Division One schools. I had the dream of going to Division One, So I was really looking to do that. But there was money issues. A lot of schools in the U.S. are really, really expensive. And so it was difficult. It was difficult to uh, make those decisions. I couldn't put my family in that situation to be able to spend that much money just to go to school. Um, so I decided I was going to do another recruiting year. I was going to spend some more time, take a fifth year in high school. And then out of the blue, a school reached out to me with a, uh, a essentially a full ride um, in July, in July going into that, into that year. And so I got reached out and I got the offer in July. In August, I got to the school, which was Drake University, which is a division one school in the Missouri Valley Conference. And uh, that was my recruiting journey. It's very uncommon, but it does it does happen. And honestly, I attribute a lot of that to be able to make the connections that you know, the connections in the game. That's where they come from. Um, you, Rena, can you talk about a bit about more about your uh, your path? Yes. So my path was a little bit different than most. So I grew up in a small town, which is a little bit far from. Um, more of the competitive soccer, youth soccer leagues. So uh, starting in grade nine, I was playing for the North Shore women's soccer team, which was about an hour and a half commute from my hometown. Um, at that time, I had started to talk to university coaches. And one of the pieces of feedback that I got was that uh, I should be playing for the BC uh, High Performance League. And so that's really what drove me to switch teams and um, play. So that's when I started to play for Fusion FC in grade 12. Um, and through that team, I started to kind of build more of those communications over email. And about, at about uh, Christmas of my grade 12 years, when I um, started to really establish that communication with the U of T coaches, saying that um, they were looking to invite me to training camp. And that was kind of my in. So as soon as I got an offer from the university academically, um, I was able to confirm that I would be at training camp. And uh, that was my tryout in August. And then I was considered a walk-on uh, for the team. For that year. Yeah. So, the, so thank you, everyone. So the key takeaway from this slide is, again, everyone goes according to their own timeline. The sooner you can do things, the better. But it really is never too late. Yeah, so I think another thing I wanted to talk about is that parents and players should work together. So one of the things that I really believe in, and by the way, I kind of only realized this now, I wish I realized this maybe sooner, is that um, for the players here, your parents will be your biggest supporter. So it's super important you make sure you're on the same page. Um, so first of all, just like in a very tangible way, your parents pay for everything. They drive you everywhere. They sign all the legal stuff. So like even just like you can't actually do much without your parents co-signing. And then also, I think emotional support. I think a lot of us, you know, want to make our parents proud. And then so it's super important that like, you know, your parents, you and your parents are sort of aligned on what your goals are. And actually I have a fun exercise for, for the players and parents here. So when you guys get home, you know, write down on a piece of paper or on your phone, open the notes app and write down each person without telling each other what your goals are for soccer. So if you're a player, write down which one, like what your goals are for soccer, your dream school, your dream team. And then parent, I want you to do the same. Write down what you think your kids dream school our dream level of soccer is and then you guys can basically see are you guys on the same page and compare how similar your answers are um so that picture up there actually is a picture of sosa's brother so you know sosa is a very interesting family that um he went to michigan his brother went to michigan state and his dad i think we'll talk a bit more about this later on but his dad used to drive them two hours to practice every day i think two four hours right two hours there two hours yeah back. two hours there two hours back every day after school i would generally miss my fifth period due to that, but my school is very accommodative of those issues and helped me along the way too, so. Yeah, so yeah, so I had a really interesting chat with uh, with uh, Uncle Moby, that's Sosa's dad. And then one of the things he said is that, you know, he said that he saw a talent in his child, he wanted to do everything to help his son succeed. And, you know, I think that's what happens when you have parents and kids that are on the same page. Um, there's a really, really good article, which I recommend you guys check out. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's called Building Trust with Parents. 
And then, yeah, all the like, I'll send you the link to that afterwards. Maybe, Aaron, if you have the link, you, maybe you can drop it in the chat. But if not, you can, we'll just send it to them afterwards. But it sort of talks a lot about building trust with parents. So I would encourage all of you guys to check that out. Okay, so what club should I join? So this part is basically talking about, you know, probably like the first step in the journey is joining a good club. So Sosa, can you maybe talk us a bit more through, you know, why you guys chose to join, go to Varder and drive two hours to practice every day? So really why I chose Varder was actually through um, a close friend of mine who I grew up playing soccer with as well. He's also my brother's teammate at Michigan State. And I guess the main thing really is to find the program organization that has your best interests at heart and will take you to where you need to be and also have, you know, like back proof of players who have also succeeded through their programs. And Varder being a pretty dominant like academy within the States, they have thousands of kids who play division one, division two soccer, and many others who are also playing pro right now too. So I guess those are probably like the main eye openers for my parents, seeing that, okay, my son is able to get the opportunity for college soccer, good mm -hmm. education, as well as good training, and also the opportunity to go pro as well. So just a really good network, I would say. Um, so definitely knowing the coaches and having a good feel about what the coaches see in you as a player and your potential, it's probably the main thing. And then, so Sokol wasn't able to make it today, but I put Sokol up on this slide because, so I think, I think, and I think Mario is going to talk a bit more about this is, but sometimes people feel like pressure to kind of leave and like travel far away to like join one of the more like, you know, well-known clubs. But Sokol actually is like almost like a hometown boy where he played for the same club that he grew up in and he still was able to like reach a lot of success. So Sokol is kind of an example of you don't always have to like, you know, move far away. Like you can, as long as you play well at the end of the day, um, you can still get noticed by coaches. So that's kind of what I wanted so to talk a bit more about. Cecilia, I think, is also kind of more of a hometown hero. And then I actually just found this out today, reading your profile, that you joined the Vancouver FC Whitecaps Academy when it first launched. Um, so maybe you can talk a bit more about your club experience. Yeah, totally. So I, similar to Sokol, so I started um, just playing at a field about like nine minutes away in the BCSBL for um, Vancouver Island Wave, um, which is a team that performs in a lot of showcases, which is obviously... I would think really important when um, looking to be recruited by universities, like try to find a team that maybe participates in the bigger tournaments. So it's more accessible for coaches to um, see your game and actually see you in person as well as maybe some other players. Um, and then, so I started with Vancouver Island Wave and then I joined Team BC. And then from Team BC, I started playing for um, the Rex Whitecaps Academy. I was there for a few years. So I was at billeting in Vancouver for that time. Um, but then I ended up actually going back to my previous club. And that is where I um, was recruited to then play for Queens University. So um, I definitely understand playing uh, for a hometown, hometown, hometown team and field. Um, and yeah, so when looking for what clubs to join, I would definitely make sure that coaches are supportive um, and really like help you in whatever route you want to take, whether that's Canadian universities or American universities. Um, additionally, speaking with coaches and friends to see what clubs maybe previous players have gone, um, maybe the route you'd like. So obviously that alludes to whether the coach has those connections, which can be really helpful. Um, but yeah, I would say just joining a team that has a positive environment that allows you to grow and be the best player possible for then um to be able to play for universities and and be seen so that's kind of how my story a little bit and how I would best approach looking for clubs before university why did you leave the Whitecaps Academy if you don't mind answering yeah totally so I was I was in grade eight and nine when I was billeting in Vancouver um and at that point, the program was transitioning to um, a long-term stay. So I would change my high school um, as well as, um, sorry, just to uh, clarify, billeting. I was living um, in Vancouver with a family of a girl who was also on the team. So yeah, I was living away from home. Um, and sorry, I was what I was saying was I... I was living in Vancouver and then going back and forth to Victoria, which is my hometown. 
Um, so on the ferry, which was a little bit of a um, little bit of a mission. Um, and then the program was transitioning to being a uh, full time in Vancouver, and I would have to move there and go to you know, or go to high school there. And at the time of being in grade nine, I wasn't ready to make that full commitment um, and leave home. So I ended up leaving the club or leaving that program and then going back to um, the BCSP, BCHPL or SPL um, team that I was previously on to continue my club career. Yeah, it seems like it's, thank you for sharing that. And it seems like uh, BC has the same problem Ontario has where like every couple of years they like make a new league that's like pretty much the old league, but with a different acronym. So like yeah. in Ontario we have like OISL, now it's OPDL. And I guess now it's BCHPL, BCSPL. Mm -hmm. Rena, can you talk a bit more about specifically, can you just talk about um, the whole thing where you reached out to the coach, they said, come back when you're playing for basically a better team and like the commute and like the, the sacrifices you had to make. Mm -hmm. So I spoke a little bit on this earlier, but my, so my hometown was um, pretty far away from the closest BCSPL team. Um, but through this white, I was in part of like the Saturday Whitecaps Academy that they offer in Vancouver. And uh, one of the coaches that I'd spoken to, uh, who was also a coach for a university mentioned, you know, like, this is great that you're here, but like, would love to see you in the BCSPL and then let me know kind of once you've made that step. And so this was a little bit difficult for me, given that it was pretty far of a commute. So um, I started kind of reaching out to different BCSPL coaches and one of the coaches for Fusion, he um, actually was a coach for the North Shore Girls Soccer Club, which is kind of how I got um, connected there. And moving to that club for me was like really a great decision because he was aware of kind of the challenges that I was having, the goals that I was like pursuing, that I wanted to play university soccer and sort of the sacrifices I was making to commute there and the sacrifices my family was making to kind of give me that opportunity. And so I think those kind of aspects really played into making that decision to commute. I, th I think it ended up being like two and a half or three hours with traffic um, from Whistler to Richmond every day. And so, yeah, it was really great. My coach was really supportive of that and like was just aware of the situation I was in. And because of that was like all the more willing to help me make this step and help me kind of progress to the next level. Thank you. And so Mario, from a coach's perspective, can you just talk a bit more about um, what players should, like what you think players should be looking for when thinking of teams, but also maybe can you talk to some of the coaches out here about like what they can do to make their program something that players would want to play for? Yeah, well, I, I would say to start off, I would say it's a, it's a great challenge for parents these days to try to figure out how to support their, you know, uh, son or daughter to where they're going to choose to play. I think Sosa, like his first comment was, I think it was a great comment. I think that the place you should choose would be the place where they actually care about you as an individual, uh, both from a, you know, from a footballing point of view and from a human point of view and uh, teaching all the values that you're going to need to carry on later on in life. So I think that's a really, really important point. Um, I, I do think there should be a balance between development and exposure. Um, there is clubs out there that are, uh, that, that have a, a very good reputation and um, you know, as far as placing players, uh, but some of those, you know, players have come, you know, in the last year and have, you know, joined a, maybe a travel team or an ID team and uh, not necessarily have been developed through that club. And I'm not speaking about any particular club, it's just in general. I, I think there has to be that balance, you know, when we talk about uh, going to showcase tournaments. Uh, normally, it's the same two or three players that are, that are identified by coaches, uh, however many are the special players in that group. So we will have teams, we will have players going into those showcase showcases but not necessarily get identified did, did i freeze there nope you're good oh, okay sorry yeah so i think as you saw like there's different uh, pathways uh, like a prime example for myself was a a young man that i had coached since he was 12 years old he was while i was at laurier i actually you know i had him uh, go he, he ended up getting a full ride to yukon and because i didn't think laurier was the right at that particular point in time was the right situation for him. Um, I, I felt it was better. He ended up going to the Vancouver residency program as well for a year. And then after that, um, as I say, when he was with the U20, uh, U20 national program. And then after that, we, you know, we thought we, we spoke about it together and he, he played with our local club and it's not something, and we're not a club that's a big club, but played with our local club since he was uh, young and uh, 
he ended up getting opportunities to to get to there. I, I think I think if you're a, a good player, I think there's many different avenues that you can get there right now, and I think there's exposure that's possible in many different ways. Very well said. Very well said. And like random example, but like Kobe Bryant and LeBron James, right? They both play for the local high school team. So if you're good, the talent, you know, people will find you. Thank you, Mario. Um, yeah. So then some other things I was just thinking about to talk about things to look for in a club. Um, so kind of, and I think some other points that maybe I think maybe were mentioned is um, alumni. So a lot of people do look at like, where do most of the players go after they leave the club? Resources, what support do they provide for players? And exposure, like what leagues and tournaments do they play in? And so maybe like a very tangible action item is that, you know, for the players and parents here is asking yourself, you know, is the club you're currently playing for, are they playing in the most competitive level of youth, youth soccer in your province or in your state? Right. Because that's usually one of the best ways to get, um, you know, to kind of get the exposure. And then also the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, so this is also for maybe clubs um, for the coaches and technical directors that are in this meeting. Some things I would really encourage you guys to do is. Um, looking is like if you guys have people in your school, in your program that have gone to like really successful clubs, I would encourage you guys to basically put that on your website and social media pages. I could I think that's like a very good way of like sort of getting people to kind of want to join your club. Um, so there's two clubs that are so. I basically looked at, I pretty much looked at all the OPDL clubs in Ontario and all the BS, BCSPL clubs in BC. And there's basically two clubs I think did a really good job of this. Ottawa South United and Coquitlam, oh, I forget the name. Coquitlam Metro Ford, yes. So yeah, so Co Coquitlam Metro Ford and Ottawa South United, they have a very like well, like organized comprehensive page of like people they've sent, like schools they've sent. So by the way, this picture here, that's from the Ottawa South United. And then this is um, Coquitlam. So they have like a really comprehensive program. So um, for those of you who are coaches, technical directors, like, you know, I think look at their website and kind of see what you can emulate and bring to your program as well. Okay, so next in the journey is how do I get noticed? So, you know, the thing about, you know, there's like a lot of things in terms of like getting exposure, there's a lot of things like game film, showcases, recruiting services, social media, a lot of people offering a lot of services. Often you have to pay money for it. Is it worth it or not? So maybe Quinn, can you just talk a bit about, I think you joined the famous, I think, NCSA. And can you talk, um, did you find it useful? How much did it cost? And, you know, maybe talk a bit about that. Yeah, so uh, I did join NCSA. I felt that they had a really, really good platform. Um, NCSA compiles all the coaching emails that you would ever need to be able to reach out to people. I would, they, they basically outline a step-by-step -step recruiting process and what you can expect. Um, they have a personal call. I felt like they had a lot of good attributes to be able to, you know, warrant the money that they cost. It, it's about a grand to be able to sign up for it. It's a lifetime subscription. It's a lot of money, but, you know, it really, it really was a dream to be able to go play in the U S. And so, uh, we managed to make it work. I paid for a good portion of it too, because, uh, my family isn't super, super well off. Um, that NCSA was a, was really, really good, actually, because it gave me the opportunity to be able to reach out to all the coaches that I wanted to be able to reach out to. It's essentially a tool that gives you the opportunity to do whatever you want to do with it. If you choose to pay for it and do nothing, then that's on you. If you choose to pay for it and use it, that's also on you. Um, it would also give you an idea of how to create a highlight video. And in my opinion, your highlight video is your foot in the door. That's your first impression. I would say that if you want to get noticed, having a strong, good highlight reel that looks good, you want to, if you can't make it yourself, you want to pay some money to make it because it's probably the best, the best bet at being able to reach out to coaches who aren't necessarily going to be able to see you play in person. Ashley, so actually you had quite an accomplished career, um, you know, NCAA, D1, Team Ontario, Team Canada as well, Team Canada U20 representing the World Cup. What, are what do you think was the stuff that helped you get noticed? I agree with a lot of what Quinn said. I think that um, you have to be a part of a program that is going to allow you to participate in showcases, right? You need to get in front of these coaches, and that doesn't necessarily mean going to the Disney tournament or um, like back in my time, I went to some tournament in Indianapolis that was really popular. You know, there's the Umbro tournament, which happens in Canada. And there's other tournaments as well, where all these coaches fly in and they're going to watch you. So that's number one. You have to get in front of these coaches from as soon as possible. For myself, I was also a part of the um, 
Team Ontario team from U14 to U16. And that gave me an opportunity to get in front of more coaches as well, because they held their own little tournaments and showcases, but you don't have to be a part of um, the Rex program. I don't even know if it's still called the Rex program. If someone could drop in the chat, I think they might've just changed the name of the program. Um, I could be wrong, but um, there's that. And then, yeah, absolutely get your highlight reel going from as soon as possible. Like most, a lot of games are filmed now. And if not, you know, like Quinn said, you can hire somebody it's still called the Rex. Okay, cool. Um, I have a few people that I could look up and potentially on our next call share with who makes these videos actually. So you can have like direct links. The Rex program is what um, the Team Ontario OSA program used to be. So it used to just be called Team Ontario, um, the provincial program, and now it's called the Rex pro program. And they've um, incorporated some, some different like styles of how to bring up the, the youth in Canada. Yeah, Nat National Play Development Center. So, um, yeah, that's my experience. I'm just making sure my slides are still good. Okay, so next, um, Ryan, can you talk a bit more about you from your perspective as a coach? Especially because I think you, I think you, you played in America as well, coached in Canada. Talk a bit more about like you know what you would recommend players to get noticed, and also from a coach's perspective, what do you look for, and how how can like a player get your attention, kind of thing? Yeah. <clears throat> um... Yeah, so I deal this with it, you know, at the club level now, and I remember it as a player, but, you know, obviously coming out of COVID, um, film was, you know, uh, very, very important. I think Quinn just touched on it that, um, you know, if you put something out there, if you can get a, a coach who has time to click and and see your your highlight tape in an email, that's great. Um, and events are great. Uh, one thing I will say, and I think Mario, you know, touched on it, um, you know, most people stay close to home when they, uh, when they go away to school, it's very rare. And I think like when you go beyond the four hours away from your home, you're, you're three times as likely to, uh, you know, to transfer out and come back home. So I think that, you know, picking events or picking combines or picking things, make sure, you know, uh, if you're going to a showcase in Florida, you know, there's obviously going to be the most people from there or North Carolina or Virginia or BC, you know, if you have no intent to go out there, it's, it is a lot of money to go. Um, but when you go to these events, there's hundreds of players that we can look at. Um, and uh, contacting a coach the Friday night before the event when we're already there and in our hotel it doesn't doesn't work. So if you're going to go to an event, just do a little bit of homework you know, before and make sure your information is sent out, your player profile, a little bit about yourself. Um, and maybe uh, in the email, um, and I know you're touching on it later, you know, a little personal um, information to let the coach know that, you know, you've researched the school. Um, I think uh, emails with a personal touch get a little bit more, get a little bit more uh, response and awareness. Um, send your schedule, um, even though a lot of times from events we have the schedule. But, you know, even if you're not a player uh, that we might be looking at, if I'm, we're going to be at your game or next to your field, might be a good chance, you know, to go. Um, recruiting services. Cause I've saw from both sides of it, whether I get an email through recruiting service or not, it makes no difference. Um, but there are time savers and things like that. I think Quinn talked on, so it's just a matter of what value is to you. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, you have to do the work ahead of time because I think like, you know, and I'm probably Mara here a lot. Um, the same two or three players like razzle dazzle at every like showcase, you know, um, and are getting um, looked at. Uh, so if you want yourself to stand out and you want a coach to come and watch you and evaluate you and see if you're the right fit, you know, um, you're going to have to, you know, reach out and contact the coach. You're not just going to, the dream of a coach shows up, watches you for 30 minutes and then hands you, hands you the bag is, is a lie. So. Thank you. And then um, last is Sosa. So, so I, yeah, especially because I feel like you have played at kind of like two top programs in Michigan and UConn. Maybe if you can talk a bit more about anything else that they haven't said about maybe things that helped you get noticed. So I guess another one, like Ashley mentioned, like the provincial team. I also played for the provincial team growing up. And for those looking for schools in Canada, um, it's a very good eye opener too for coaches to be able to see you, see your skill and talent and build relationships and communication through there. As well as if you're trying to also aspire to go pro, like you'll be there and you'll have York 9, various different um, professional teams there. 
national coaches watching your games, whether you're playing against other pro provinces and whatnot. So I'll say that's also a very key um, avenue that you could also keep into consideration. Uh, I would say also for film, make sure it's also like very distinctive that the players, you can be identified on the pitch because, you know, some coaches don't want to just get a video and it's very blurry, right? So they can't identify you. So like if you're making a video, try, I recommend in adding circles so they can actually see where you are on the pitch. And yeah, that's basically, I'll say those are the most ideal ways and different techniques to really get, get this thing going. Awesome. Just to jump in here, if you guys, um, I don't know about you, Sosa, but I have a highlight reel on YouTube. So if you're looking to make one, you can go and search our names and kind of yeah. see what they look like and get an idea. Yeah, if need be, I'll just drop it down in the chat too, just to make it easier. Yeah, and also I think all the mentor profiles, we're going to add like your highlight reels to your profiles as well. So if you, if you, if you check out their profiles, you'll be able to see their reels as well. And then, um, yeah, and also I think I think the big thing I wanted to, wanted to talk, say is too, I feel like sometimes people feel like, you know, sometimes Canadian soccer can feel like a pay to play thing. So I don't want anyone here to feel like, you know, you have to pay money to be successful in soccer. I mean, the reality is we live in a capitalist society, so money does help. But I think that like, if, if you're like a hardworking player and you have talent, you don't like, you know, coaches, coaches want, coaches will want you on their team. And like, I've noticed that like, a lot of clubs too will like offer, you know, incentives to players to join their team. So definitely don't feel like, you know, you need to pay for these things. Like, you know, at the end of the day, soccer is like a merit meritocracy. If you play, I mean, to an extent. So if you play well, coaches will definitely try to notice you. So I've kind of, I think we've already covered a lot of this stuff in the previous slide. So I don't know, maybe like if Corinna or Carly or Ryan want to add anything else that wasn't already mentioned. Uh, I'll just add on to some of the stuff that Ryan said. Obviously, I think the, the most common way is for, for players to reach out via email. It might sound obvious and silly, but please direct us by our actual name. Um, it's very, very simple for coaches to tell if an email has been copy and pasted. Um, for example, saying my name, but commenting on Ryan's school, for example. Hey, Carly, I really love to come to the University of Windsor. Great. I don't work at the University of Windsor. For me, I don't know about uh, Mario and, and Ryan, but that's an automatic delete because the attention to detail is is not there and, and how much you really want to come to to that school if you if you can't even match up the right school with the the right coach um and, and also if you're going to copy and paste a generic part of your email just make sure it matches the the rest of the text because again it, it's very obvious for us to be able to tell um how much time you spent um in that so um and then the other piece that i'll just add because it hasn't really been touched on is for example at a showcase event personally i love when players or, or young players come in and speak to me face to face. Um, I think that's starting to get lost in, in the way that we recruit and interact with players. Like I'll be at a showcase event and people will walk by and you can see them trying to look at the logo and then they awkwardly walk by and like smile. Like if you're genuinely interested in the school, go and speak to the coach. I think there's a lot of power in putting a name to a face and Honestly, guys, in Canada, it's not just about footballing ability. There are probably the U.S. as well, um, unless you're going to a top, top five school or coming out of a national development center. Um, it, it's a big personality piece as well. And it's like whether you're going to fit the culture that lies within that program and get along with the coach. So and, and that's really hard to judge um, just via email or, or video. So I think um, there's a lot of value to face to face conversation. So be brave. Reach out. It's a part of growing up. Um, just say hello. There's no harm. I promise you we're not that scary as coaches. Um, it, it's a big piece. And you'll stand out because there's not a lot of players that do it. The amount of people that come up and say, hello, I'm really interested in your school. Tell me more about it or this is who I am. Um, it, it's quite rare nowadays. So that, that's one piece that I would um, add on to some of the stuff that other coaches have spoke about already. Well said. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Um, so yeah, so the, I'm going to, um, so Quinn and Drayden both sent me sample emails and then we actually decided this actually is not the best example. So I'm going to add a better example of some emails that you guys can use if you want for what to send your emails to coaches. So again, we'll send you guys the link to the slides after the presentation, and this will include an example of an email that you can send to coaches. Okay, how do I decide what school to pick? Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. Um, Cecilia, let's start with you. You know, BC girl, went to school in Ontario, why? Yeah, so I um, was pretty set on like which schools I wanted to go into in Canada. So I I wasn't really worried about not being close to home. I 
I, as I mentioned previously, I lived in Vancouver when I was quite young by myself. And then I also moved to France and played um, semi-professionally for five months in high school. So it was not out of my comfort zone to move away. So um, I kind of started my process just by tracking what I felt like the best Canadian university soccer programs and kind of associating with their programs and seeing kind of what I felt matched what I was um, interested in. Um, and then once kind of establishing and narrowing down to a few schools, I was looking for maybe the reputation of the coach and whether I felt like I connected well with them. And as Carly mentioned, whether I felt like I fit into that team environment. Um, and then of course, you can't only think about athletics, you're a student as well. So I looked at the programs that each school offered and how they fit into what I was interested for my future career. Um, and even further than that, I looked at maybe what the employment rate was coming out of the un these universities and these programs to see again, like how well they've done, how the alumni at these schools have done. Um, and then once I narrowed it down to, for me in Canadian schools, I narrowed it down to UBC, Queens University and McGill University. I started looking more into detail as far as like the location of the university and maybe like the campus location and whether kind of what vibe I wanted of the of the schooling and such. Um, and then I also, again, was really interested in doing abroad programs. Um, so I wanted to see what their Erasmus and overseas opportunities were as far as exchange and such for each program. Um, so that was um, kind of how I went about it. Um, and then I narrowed it down to um, the Smith School of Business at Queen's University. And that's kind of how I approached um, choosing my university. Thank you. Sosa, for you, I know, I remember when we talked on the phone that you were recruited by some pretty, um, some pretty like impressive programs. So maybe can you tell me some of the schools that were, that were trying to recruit you and then why you picked Michigan? So some of the schools I had were Syracuse, Duke, Georgetown, uh, Michigan, Michigan State, and Ohio State. So really for me, some of the main components I would say I chose when like trying to pick out my school was academics for one, the culture of the team and the culture of the coaches with the team is really crucial because you got to see how the coach like displays himself amongst the team themselves. Just by going to a game, seeing his interactions with his family, and whatnot really plays a big picture as to, you know, whether or not you would actually like to consider that school. And then also players who have gone to that school. So I guess in my case, because I'm aspiring to go pro, I'll say players from that school who are in the league already. So like you mentioned before, like Kyle Laren, uh, Kwame Awua, those are all UConn alumni, Francis Atuahene, uh, Michigan alumni, they're all playing at the top levels right now, right? So like just seeing as many, you know, players going pro also really um, inspired me to make those decisions, I would say. Thank you, so so. So in the interest of time, we're going to um, skip the next three. But if you guys have anything else you want to add during the Q&A, you can definitely bring it up again. Um, so what do I need to know about scholarships? Um, so actually, for this one, I'm going to ask um, Ashley, because I didn't even realize I actually got a full ride. So Ashley, can you please talk a bit more about your full ride scholarship? And if you can give numbers, too, I think people always appreciate numbers, if you don't mind sharing numbers. So what was that conversation like with the scholarships? And like, how did that go? Okay, so to give you guys a little bit of context, this was like 10 years ago, so I am trying my best to remember exactly how it went. I went to the University of Dayton, which is a um, private school, so it was a lot more than your typical school, I guess. Eight hours from home, um, $40,000 tuition per year, and in conversation, um, they were looking for a striker. Um, I committed like, like I said, like a year before I actually went to the school and um, there was a little bit of negotiating going on, which my dad kind of handled. I wish he was here today, but I think he'll be on the next one. Um, so I, I did receive a full scholarship. The first year, though, I paid around like $2,500. 
And then the remainder was like, the agreement was kind of like, if you like prove, you know, that you can really bring something to the team, then for the remaining, you'll have a full ride. So it was like just shy of a full ride. Um, yeah, I would say like mostly my dad just handled those financials and um, it just worked out in my favor. And then I think so. I think um, I think you and Ashley pretty much have similar experience. Maybe Ryan, you can answer this part. So Canadian soccer system is a bit different. Can you talk a bit more about like um, what the scholarship looks like for Canadian players? Sure. I mean, uh, just from an OUA perspective, you know, we're limited to what we can offer. Um, you know, we can offer now up to up to five thousand uh, dollars for scholarship um, per year. Um, it's it's not uh, which runs out to be like with fees and everything included about half tuition. Um, other provinces are, are, are different rules. So I can only speak from Ontario. Um, and then kind of what I, what I would say about what you need to know about scholarships is it's not about how much scholarship you get. It's about how much you're paying. And, and, um, most people, uh, aren't on scholarship or aren't on significant scholarship. Um, I think, you know, that's part of your movement here. You're trying to help in other ways because, there's not as much money, especially on the men's side. And I'm talking from an NCAA perspective, flowing around as people think. Um, and a lot of people spend a lot of money um, going to school. So it's important that you have that conversation. That's probably the, the first real adult conversation many people may have with their parents. When I went through it as a player um, back before, you know, Ivy Leagues could give, you know, any athletic scholarship, they only gave financial aid and we didn't qualify for that. So getting a second mortgage on a house wasn't an option to go to Brown for me. So um, you know, I think that's, you know, that's the big thing, you know, it's cool to get a $20,000 scholarship, but if you have to pay 20,000 us to go to school every year, then it maybe it doesn't make sense. So that's very, what I would say. Well, very well said. Thank you. And that actually brings us perfectly to the next slide, which is, so these are just some numbers for guys to be aware of. Um, I really like, I really like Ryan's point about how it's not just, it's not just a sticker price. It's not, it's not just like the floor. I think it's also no total cost of tuition. Also, something I found out, I think, either today or a couple of days ago, and I found this out like last week when I was talking to Carly, Canada West, I didn't know this, you can actually get unlimited scholarships amount. So I feel like a lot of players go from BC to Ontario. But if you're in Ontario, you know, I'd encourage you to like, you know, explore Canada, go out West, you can probably get a lot more scholarships there. I'll just, I'll just, I just want to clarify, it's not unlimited, it can only be used to mandatory costs. So what that means is pretty much your tuition fees and any kind of additional fees so your auxiliary fees and anything like that that gets added on to your tuition so it like like it says it doesn't include books and it doesn't include residence food room and board or anything like that so it's just tuition and mandatory costs so like uh, he has there as an estimate seven thousand dollars so it could be up to your tuition everything else you still have to cover so i just want to make sure people don't misinterpret the un unlimited word on there that's a good point actually because i think in america full ride literally means like residents and everything else but in Canada full ride doesn't include to um books and all that kind of stuff however though like it can still like it can still be a lot of money right because sometimes tuition like mine was 30 grand a year so you know just something for you guys to kind of consider also sorry don't yep. interrupt but um just another thing about scholarships to keep in mind is um they um when you get a scholarship in your first year definitely athletic it's not I, at least I believe for most schools, it's not guaranteed for every year you'll receive the same amount. There's like a, like a, a large sum and they allocate it to um, players within the team. So it's just important to keep in mind that maybe I'll speak about my own experience. In my first year, I was given like the max amount um, a player can get for scholarships. And then that it, dropped like 50 percent into my second year and reasoning is because players coming into first year obviously the coach wants to provide them with a large sum for them to come to the university so it's just something to think about um for my own experience it started at the max amount for my first year decreased in my second year decreased in my third year and then went to the highest amount again, because I believe the sum was increased from my first year from like the max amount you can give. And then I was given the largest amount in my fourth year. So just to keep in mind, cause obviously tuition doesn't change but your scholarships can, which sometimes can be um, difficult when you're managing and budgeting and so on. Um, so I see a great question here from F. 
maybe we save this for a Q&A because I want to make sure we're watching time. So Aaron, can you maybe make a note of this question that F just put in, it's about international students. And then please make sure we get to that in the Q&A. And honestly, Cecilia, that was a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Also, next, scholarships ran and received. So maybe just like very briefly, um, so uh, do we have time? Okay, let's just talk about it. So another thing I wanted to talk about is um, academic scholarships. So again, like because schools are limited by athletic scholarships, like I said, 30 people on the roster, 9.9. .9. You know, Crane made a brilliant point when I talked to him that like, that's not even enough for like a starting 11 roster. So what a lot of people do is if you get your grades up, you can pay for your tuition that way. So Rena, I believe she said, so these are all the scholarships that Rena received. This was the only one that was a soccer scholarship. And actually, Rena, I think also the Whistler Youth one is also a soccer scholarship, right? Yes, yes. It's like soccer and community service. Yeah, so for a lot of players, if you're not able to get, you know, like an athletic scholarship, if you if you get your grades right, you can, um, you know, you can still basically get a lot of tuition that way. And also if you're involved in the community, if your grades are like, okay, but like you're very involved, you can get scholarships that way as well. And then an interesting thing I noticed um, when Rena sent me the scholarship she won, she said that she got a full ride to Queens. So as you guys remember, she got a full ride to Queens, but she went to U of T. Can you tell us, you know, how do you turn on a full ride scholarship? I will just kind of say from similar to what Carly and Cecilia were saying, really about the overall fit of a player um, to the community, to the team, to the environment. It's really just about um, kind of evaluating what your goals are, what, sorry, what your goals are and really seeing like where you will fit in the best. Um, for me personally, I always knew that I wanted to go to a big city. And so um, it was really Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal um, and the small town uh, atmosphere of Kingston just wasn't like exactly the environment that I was looking for. Um, really nothing against the university itself, but in terms of where I saw the best fit for myself was um, the bigger city. And um, okay, next thing. So how is the transition to university soccer? So maybe I will um, pick hmm, Cecilia for this one. Actually, I think you can. So Cecilia, you're captain of the Queens. So a big thing that happens to a lot of players is that usually in high school, you're the best player on your team. You come to university, like everyone's the best player on their team. And then so sometimes a lot of times with playing times, people get very upset. And this is something that came up a lot in conversations I had with people. So and I know you as you as captain, you have some experience with this. So what advice would you give people who are maybe thinking about like playing time when they get to university, things like that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely difficult. Um, obviously everyone who's going into on a U sport team is was great in their club team and that's why they're pursuing it further. Um, I guess the way I approached it, um, I kind of just went in, into it with an open mind. I had no real expectations and obviously that's hard and like it's inevitable to have some slight preconceived notions, but. I kind of went into it with just the mindset that um, whether I do play every minute or start or whether I um, am maybe coming in, in the, into later of the game or even just not dressing, it's kind of, I had the mindset that I would own whatever role I was given. So whether that means, again, if I'm playing every minute, then I'm going to play the hardest I can when I am playing. And if I'm not, then when I come in, I will try to affect and be the most impactful in the play that I possibly can with the amount of time that I'm given. Um, so I would say my, it's, it's difficult, obviously, um, but I would say just going into it with an open mindset. And also if it helps when you're surrounded by supportive teammates and supportive coaches and just having that open conversation, if you did have an expectation and maybe it's not being met, then speaking with your coach and kind of being really transparent with how you're feeling, obviously in a respectful way, just so you can kind of get onto a common ground and maybe the coach can help you learn on what maybe you can improve to get those extra minutes or be wearing the jersey on the side of the pitch. So um, I think that can also be really helpful in your process. Um, but also just know that um, everyone on the field is, is kind of wanting the same thing. So, and just know that there's no, you, no one deserves a role. Everyone like works for the role and just, yeah, kind of approaching it like that and trying not to have any, too many expectations going into it initially. Cause yeah. In the interest of time, I'll go to Mario. So Mario, can you talk a bit about, um, yeah. So like, this is actually a big problem. Cause I've talked to a lot of players and like, this comes up a lot, like playing time, People are upset about it. Sometimes people say it's politics. I don't know. But um, yeah, so from, from a coach's perspective, like how do you handle the playing time thing? 
And also, if a player is not happy with their playing time, how do you want them to approach you? Well, just in, for, for the sake of time, I'll be very quick on this. Um, one thing is playing, especially if there's an adjustment period for every player stepping up, whether it's the NCA level or the uh, OUA level. Uh, there's an adjustment period for every player. Every player adjusts differently. Uh, our philosophy is very simple. Uh, if you're a first year, second year, third year, fourth year player, and you're on the team, you have the opportunity to win a spot to play. Every week you battle for a spot. If you earn it, you'll play. Uh, it, it's as simple as that. The one, I think the one comment or, or a question that we commonly get from everybody is the balance, the, the, the worry about how am I going to handle my academic load with my uh, commitment with, uh, with the soccer? Because it's every, like we have an everyday commitment training and then you're, your uh, your games one of the questions that parents are and and players are concerned about they will always get asked how do i do that i don't know if i'm going to be able to handle it historically and i've been there for over 20 years historically every year uh the marks of our athletes are always better during the season than they are mm, the i've heard that as well yeah yeah and the reason that i mean it's a pretty i think it's a pretty simple equation it's uh you're just not going to waste as much time during the season uh you're much more directed uh, your time's much more occupied uh, it's easier to manage your time uh, in the off season. You know, there's a little bit less less commitment to the soccer for some programs, um, and then there's obviously a little bit more time to waste. So, um, and as far as the last question that you had, so I, again, I don't want to take up so much time. The last question you had: How do I do it? We believe in a very very open um, and honest door policy. Uh, we want to be real with all of our players. I think players today, and and things have changed a lot. I think the way we communicate is probably, I would say for me, it's definitely different. Uh, but I always believe in being honest and, and, and being transparent with the players and giving them feedback as to not only, you know, while you're not playing, I, what they can do better, or if it's even possible at this point in time, or what does it look like for them to play? I think we just got to be honest and fair. And then if they can achieve that and they can improve those areas, then we got to be, we got to hold up our end of the bargain. That's what I would say. Thank you. And now I am watching the time. So what I'm probably, probably going to do is maybe we extend the Q&A for a bit. So if people have to leave early, that's fine. If people want to stay for a bit longer, you can do that. But I'll just extend everything by a bit more 15 minutes. I want to make sure everyone has time to ask questions. Yeah, so what's the transfer process like? So maybe for this one, Courtney, maybe you can just take this question. So um, Harv asked, asked me a question. Harv, can you send a DM to Aaron about the question so Aaron can keep track of the questions to ask during the Q&A? So Harv, the question you asked me, just send it to Aaron, Aaron Dorfler in the chat. So what's the transfer yeah. process like? Um, so Cordy, you, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be really quick with this one since you got to get in before you can transfer, first of all. So I think it's the biggest thing is just kind of being honest and kind of having character as well, because if you do want to transfer, oftentimes coaches might ask your coach about how you were, what's your character like, you know, how's he going to deal with the team? And for me, that was the biggest thing was getting that recommendation from my coach from Wilma Mary to go to Columbia. And that's the reason he was able to give me a look essentially. Cause I, I didn't transfer because of soccer. I transferred because of academics and changed my major. And so it was a hard decision, but I had to ask my coach to kind of put in a good word for me essentially. And so I just say, that's always a good thing to, you know, be honest, have good character. Um, cause I had a teammate that wanted to trans transfer to UVA and he went about it the wrong way. And the coach blocked the transfer at the time. I think that's not allowed anymore in the NCAA, but he went about it just the wrong way. So. So what did, back wasn't really honest stuff like that okay i was gonna ask you like what what does the wrong way mean what does that mean what's that what does the wrong way mean yeah yeah like you said he just went he, he didn't tell the coach at all initially uh went around the coach's back um yeah i guess that's the, that's the wrong way in a sense so just being open to an extent you know and being honest you know and then maybe another thing too is the whole thing about um like i guess as an ivy league student is there maybe any like nuances going from like a school like William and Mary to like Ivy League that people might want to be aware of? Um, not in that essence that I can really think of. Because uh, William and Mary was a pretty good academic school as well. So, I mean, if you're coming from a, you know, less academic rigor or school, then I think it's just making sure that you know what you're getting into um, in terms of your schedule and things of that nature. I know for me, I was an engineer and I was the only, like engineers, like we had a different schedule than like everyone else on the team. And so the coach specifically liked people that were not engineers because the engineer schedule was just kind of a little bit more tough and kind of missing practice or kind of being late to practice and stuff like that. So um, I had a more rigorous schedule than a lot of the other players on the team. So things can, you know, it just kind of depends on the system, on the coach and what they're looking for and stuff. So it's all about communication and being, you know, 
open essentially yeah that's a great point and actually if, if anyone has a question about what like what it's like balancing like very rigorous programs like engineering med side with with the varsity sport you can ask that during q a i think me corday and rena all did engineering while playing on the soccer team and i can tell you for a fact that like it's very hard to have a practice schedule that doesn't coincide with your classes so yeah if you have questions about that you can ask during the q a and if you have questions and more questions about the transfer um social transfer from michigan to yukon and then Korean transferred between two NCAA D1 schools and then back to OUA. So during the Q&A, if you have any questions about that, um, please ask them. What are my options after university soccer? So finally, we have uh, Christy. So Christy played in Queens, then went to Karlskoga in Sweden. So Christy, can you please talk about your journey? Yeah, for sure. I'll keep it brief. And I guess if anyone has any additional questions, like feel free to reach out uh, to me after. But I think Cece did a really good job of explaining sort of the process, like getting to university and everyone did. And I would say it's quite similar for life after university. Obviously, there's many different paths. You can decide to continue studying, do graduate school. Um, and for me, after four and a half years, I wanted to take a chance and see if I could go play professionally. So I think Something that was super important and that what enabled me to pursue that sort of dream was like working hard and not giving up because first year it, it was pretty tough for me I actually started off I came in sort of I didn't dress even my first few weekends of games so my first year was pretty tough and grinding through that essentially solidified my starting spot in my second year. Um, but I think like it was super important at that point to not give up and keep believing in yourself and I think throughout your university. Um, just like you're doing in high school, create clips and it'll make your life at the end of university when you do want to decide to go pro and you have those little files of like, okay, highlights of first year, second year, third year, fourth year, they're already there. It saves you having to go back and try and find film that might not exist anymore. Um, so I'd say be proactive about keeping track of film uh, as well as building a player CV. And I think reaching out to people who are already on teams that you aspire to go to or have maybe for me, I was in youth sports, reaching out to other youth sports players who had decided to go pro. What agents did you use? How did you get over there? Because everyone's story is different and everyone's agent or path is different. So I was super fortunate to head over to Sweden and um, navigating the whole agent process is still a journey. Like I've switched agents a couple of times, tried to go out on my own. There's many different ways you can go about it. Um, but I think something that's consistent is you have to be the biggest believer in yourself and don't be afraid to reach out and connect with people because a lot of people want to help you. They are willing to share advice and share their experiences, just like I'm willing to do the same for anyone who's younger. So I just kept it super brief. But if there's any other specific questions about how to go pro after school or how do you approach that or more specific questions about my queen's career, played with Cece for a few years so it's cool when I was in I think my third or fourth year she was just in her first year so I was the captain at the time or my senior years and now to see her doing the same thing is pretty cool it's cool to see the full circle come through so feel free to reach out directly if you have any other questions thank you Christy um Ashley can you talk a bit more about sort of what you were doing after soccer and then also talk a bit about yeah some like the new new things that you're working on yeah for me um I would assume that there's some young ladies in here that potentially want to play after school professionally, maybe Canadian national team. But for me, when I graduated from Dayton, my options were um, I can go play professionally in the NWSL, which for those who don't know, that's the Women's Professional League in America. So um, like the MLS, but for women, which has been growing immensely over the past uh, six years or so, um, or I could go overseas somewhere. So right after school, I actually did go down to Chicago and I was playing for their reserve team, for their NWSL reserve team, um, ended up tearing my hamstring. So that was really unfortunate. And I didn't get a chance with the, um, with the, with the team there to actually dress and go play any game. So after that, I kind of went home, healed up a little bit. And then um, somebody like an agent reached out to me from well, not an agent, it was one of the coaches reached out to me from the Czech Republic. I played for a club in Uhorsky Hradište, quite the mouthful. Um, and you know what, to be completely honest, it wasn't what I expected. Like the level wasn't what I expected. And I still had a really great experience and got to kind of taste what um, the pro level is like. It's not one of the top countries for women's soccer for pro, um, but I got a little taste. And then 
Um, afterwards, I decided to come home and play in League One for a couple of years. So I played for FC London and they were the top team at the time, won a few championships with them. And, um, you know, all, growing up through my life, I wanted to play on the women's national team and I wanted to play soccer for as long as possible um, if my body allowed me, but my goals kind of changed and I was kind of, you know, satisfied with my career. So I think from that, I just say like, if your dreams change or if like the journey changes and you don't exactly get to where you once wanted to, it's okay. Like be, take it as far as you can and, you know, be satisfied with, with what you've created and what you've done. Um, try new things, try, you know, reach out and do a lot of the things that Christy was saying. Um, but yeah, I'm retired now and I just play for fun, just like 66 co-ed. Um, I play in Toronto here and I'm also really turning a new chapter and really mentoring like young female athletes. Um, if male athletes feel like they resonate as well, then that's totally fine. But I just feel like I have more to give to the sport. And I know it's not through playing anymore at that high level. Uh, I just feel like I have a lot of really great experiences to share. So really excited to be a part of Atila. And yeah, thanks everybody for, for coming and, and showing out. And like Christy said, you can reach out directly if you want to chat more. Amazing. Amazing. Well said. Um, yeah. And Aaron, please don't forget to drop a link to uh, Ashley's profile as well. Yeah. So like we said, life after university soccer, there's lots of options. Um, maybe a little pop quiz for people in the chat. Speakers, you're not allowed to guess for this one. Can anyone in the in the audience guess who this player is? Um, just, if you know, just type in the chat. Maybe I'll wait for like 10, five seconds. Okay, that is Tejan Buchanan. So Tejan Buchanan, he played for Syracuse. And then now he plays for Club Bruges in Belgium and obviously the Canadian national team. So this is someone that went from playing D1 to playing and scoring in the Champions League. So again, it shows you that it is very possible to play university soccer and play the highest level. And of course, we have our very own Christy Gray, you know, one of the top strikers at Queens and now doing the work in uh, Sweden. So again, there's lots of options for you man or women to like play at the next level, as well as like grad school, retiring or coaching. So now is time for the questions Q&A. And actually, um, while we're doing the Q&A, if people can maybe put in the chat what city you're joining from and the club and position that you play. Um, and if you're a parent or coach, just say that you're a parent or coach so that we kind of know who's here. So put in the chat what city you're joining from your club and position. And now let's open the floor for questions. And maybe let's get the ball rolling with those two questions that were asked in the uh, chat. So maybe, Aaron, can you ask the first question? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so these are for the coaches on the call. So um, Mario, Ryan, and Carly. So the first question from F was, is there a setup for international student athletes in Canada who their tuition may be over $50,000, for example? Is there something different than what's covered for domestic students? Um, no, no, not in Ontario, as, as far as I know. Um, other provinces have international waivers and different limits and scholarship that they can give, but any money that we give to any student above, uh, over and above something that would be available to the general student body is deemed AFA. So that's financial aid, you know, the athletic financial aid. So it'd be the same uh, scholarships that are available. I'll just add on that. There are a couple of schools, as Ryan mentioned, out West. Um, I don't know about the other conferences, uh, whether in the in um, Quebec RSEQ or out east uh, AUS, but there are a handful of schools um, that do have tuition waivers out west uh, for international students. Thank you. Next question here. Yeah. Um, so the next question is also actually for the coaches as well. Um, Harv is wondering if it's frowned upon to negotiate or see if there is some more money available in terms of a scholarship amount. Because sometimes there's coaches that start off by saying that they have money available. They're just wondering how the best way to go about that would be. Sorry, can you clarify? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Sure. Um, yeah, I can repeat it. So Harv is wondering uh, if it's frowned upon to negotiate or see if there's more money available for a scholarship amount. Because sometimes coaches start off by saying that they have some available, but they're just trying to figure out what the best way to go about that would be. 
I'll uh, I'll chime in. Like in 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 Ontario, in our situation, I'll give like two examples. Um, I I think we're all like human beings, and the world's expensive. Um, at the end of the day, uh, in Ontario, as a coach, I, I I don't have enough have the ability to have enough funds to change someone's life. I can make things easier with a thousand bucks or or two thousand bucks. Or if they come back to me and say I need more, maybe I can give them more, uh, but it's not like life changing. So I think that, like I said, it's about, again, how much you can pay. And that's a family conversation because I went through it as a, as a player. I've gone through it as, you know, I was, uh, I led the conversation with my younger brother when he chose a school, you know, to go uh, division one. So I think it's um, just be honest about your conversation and your parents too. Right. You have to be honest about your budget with the coach and most coaches that I know, actually every coach that I know is honest about our budget with you. Like we're not playing games. Like we don't, you know, we're not, if we had money, if we have money to everybody, we know how expensive things are. Um, and we do everything we can to help close the gap. You know, there's guys can find jobs on campus or guys can find jobs in the community, whatever as well, but it's about, you know, being able to pay for your education and living. So it's not as much negotiation as just open, honest conversation of it's feasible or it's not in a, you know, in what your family's plan is. And I think every coach will be supportive of you if you're open and honest, you know. Corinne, I think you have actually a very interesting experience on this too, right? Because if I understand correctly, and however, however much you're comfortable sharing, but I think at one point, so you went to the States and they told you we have like X amount of dollars for you available. Then it can't, turned out that kind of wasn't the case anymore. And then you had to, you know, so can you talk to me a bit, a bit more about what? how that went for you and like how that conversation went with the coaches and stuff? Yeah, so that actually happened at Manhattan College. Um, that was in the middle of COVID. And so the school's budget was changing. So when I uh, when I committed to the school uh, from transferring from another Division One program, I was promised X amount of money throughout years, sort of like how other uh, athletes have experienced. Uh, your money will, will change year to year. And it's a lot of it's performance based too. Um, the reality is schools are looking for the best players all the time. And there were, you know, attractive um, outfield players that were coming in from national teams. A French national team player was being recruited and they needed a lot of money to come in. So my coach decided to take a bit of what was promised to me when I was kind of on the threshold of being able to stay at the school to give it to the attacking player, because that's how that's how life is for a goalie. And uh, that that affected my ability to stay at the school. And uh, they felt comfortable that they that they could bring this person in. They tried to get academic, more academic money for me th uh, from the school, and that didn't quite work out. So I wasn't able to stay. Um, despite coach protests, I just couldn't I couldn't financially do it anymore, and it made sense to come back home. So that's that's how that sort of worked out for me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Quinn and Ryan, for those two um, answers. We I'd have like to add to that, uh, Tom, and what just done what Ryan said. Uh, as far as the transparency and honesty, uh, as a coach, I think when we speak about money, and I would agree with Ryan, like the amount that we're able to offer it, it is not life changing. Uh, it, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world or the beginning of the world. But I, I think being honest from the beginning. So when we offer players uh, uh, athletic money, AFAs, uh, I tell them what I can give them. And I don't really negotiate because I've given them the best that I can right from the beginning. I don't like to go back to a player when he comes back to me and says, well, this school's giving me an extra 500 bucks. Can you top it? Uh, I, I, I don't like doing that because I think it's just not, it's not very ethical. Uh, I've given you what I can give you right from the beginning. And hopefully that's, that's going to fit the thing. And if you really want to come to school, there's a balance of why you're making that decision. Uh, I think you know, going back and forth negotiating, I, I don't particularly like that. I don't, we don't do that. Uh, I just tell them, this is what we have. This is what we're, you know, what we can really allocate to you. Hopefully it's going to be good enough. And I think that that is something that they have to point of view from the negotiations. We don't, yeah, I, I don't really like negotiations. I, this is not a, it, it's not a business business deal in the sense there's a, there, there's a lot of other things that are involved. And I think we want to start off on an ethical foot right from the beginning. I'll just I'll just add on quickly before you move on. Um, totally agree. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, be cautious of of bluffing and and playing schools against each other. Because yes, we compete against each other, but we also speak. 
Um, so when you're playing in your game and you look over and there's six coaches from the o- OUA standing there, they are talking and, and whether you think it's true or not, we do talk about you. Um, and I've had a, uh, an example or a situation a couple of years ago where I was speaking to a coach and I was like, Oh, sh- she said that you offered this much. She's like, that's not true. And it resulted in both of us kind of declining our offers and being like, you know what, like in terms of character of a kid, that's not what we want in our program. And, and like Ryan and Mary said, the, the reality is in Canada is $500 going to really deter you from going to school you want versus someone who's offering you more. So um, trust your gut, follow your heart, $500 in, as you saw in a $63,000 student loan, is that really worth it? Um, so I totally agree with Mario and, and Ryan there, but just wanted to say um, we do talk. So just be careful if you're going to um, negotiate. Yeah, um, I think an interesting, an interesting conversation for definitely another day would be like negotiation in Canadian schools versus American schools, especially because I feel like when there's a lot more money at stake, uh, you know, things get a lot more intense. But that's just an interesting thought for another time. I think maybe last question um, is from Matt. So maybe Matt, Aaron, can you read the question from Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Um so Matt's wondering when most Canadian schools finish up recruiting for the next season. So in other words, he says, on average, when is it too late to be considered for a roster spot? Um, I guess I can jump in and I you might not like me for this because I, I, I'm going to say it's never too late. Um, I'll just give you an example because it was kind of a, a, a good story this year. Uh, it's my first year at Brock, um, but we had walk on tryouts and and one kid just had her heart set on Brock and she came to walk on tryouts and she ended up playing every minute of every game and, and finished as an OUA first team all-star. Wow. Um, and so you have someone who's going to walk on tryouts and finishing as a first team OUA all-star um, over players who, who probably were recruited. Um, so uh, that timeline looks different for everyone. And the other thing I'll add is it's different for every school. Um, I'll just add, I think coming from out West um, they're a little bit, uh, ahead of OUA schools, just based on my experience. Uh, when I got here, I thought I was going to be way behind because of when I arrived. Um, but I think I'm right on par with with the other OUA schools. So I'm sorry I can't give you a black and white answer. I, I think it's the, everyone's timeline is different, and and every school's timeline is different too. Um, our rosters change last minute as well. Sometimes we have people knocking our on our door in April and May and say, you know what, I'm not coming back next year. Um, so our our rosters vary as well. So. Um, I'm sure Ryan and Mary have some more thoughts, but that's would be my thoughts. Yeah, I I, uh, I can kind of chime in and you know explain that I've had transfers come home or or you know players come that um, come in, but uh, you know for those who are talking about scholarships to kind of tie it in, um, the only time I really put timelines a lot of times is uh, is on scholarships because we'll we'll we will allocate funds. Um, on the guy's side, I think it becomes, uh, because the women in the NCAA, the recruiting cycle is so early, um, the guy's side is a little bit later. So a lot of times right now you'll have, um, men holding out for, uh, for NCAA money late and then waiting to make their decision on OUA, you know, late, you know, a lot of times we're like, uh, three quarters done our recruiting class right now. Um, we have a few spots left, like for this coming fall. And that's usually kind of the position we're in, but if you're good enough and you show up on and walk ons, you're going to like, you know, I don't think Mario's going to, you know, shoo you away. So, um, you know, but yeah, you want to get to it as early as possible. And uh, if you can find the right fit, I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah. The only ad- addition to that would be the only thing that, and, and we're already looking to do some recruiting for the following season, not the upcoming one. The only thing that I would say is really where it's affected is more the money like the athletic uh, funding, Uh, you know, by this time now, we have already pretty well committed all of our funding to players for the upcoming season. So if somebody's coming to us, you know, in the next couple of months, you know, I really want to come really good player, uh, but looking for money, uh, you know, it, it, from our perspective, that would be too late for us from that perspective. Thank you so much. And then um, that concludes the presentation. Let me just share my screen in terms of next steps. So thank you again, everyone, so much for joining. Um, Yeah, like I said, I will send out an email afterwards with all the information, the recording as well. So if you missed anything today, or if you people who can attend, you can share that with them. 
um, meeting with the mentor. Yeah. So like, is there anyone you met today that you want to talk a bit more with? Um, um, Aaron, can you please drop the mentorship link as well in the chat so then people can um, talk to the mentors? Um, students join the Discord. Yeah, so if you're a student, we're basically creating a Discord for other student athletes who want to play at the next level. Um, so like, if you have questions about that, you can you can join that Discord. If you have questions, you can email me or message us on Instagram. Always happy to answer more questions, answer anything else you did, we didn't talk about last time. And then super important, please, 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 we have a feedback form. Aaron, can you please drop a link to the uh, feedback form? in the chat. Actually, drop a link to the feedback form first, because that's the most important thing. So this is our first time doing this. I think it went really well. And um, I, I'm already, I've already thought of a lot of things we can do better for next time. So please fill out that form. Let me know what you want to see next time, what you like, what could be better, etc. Cool. Yeah. So that concludes our presentations. Um, and then also for the attendees, thank you so much for joining us. You are free to go now. Thank you so much for watching. The slides and recording are available at atila.ca slash resources.